Hi, this is Mr. Anderson. Welcome to Biology Video Essentials 52. This is on cellular variation. If I could summarize this whole podcast in one quote, it would be this, that variety is the spice of life. So the greater the variation, the more likely a cell is able to deal with changes in their local environment. And so, uh, example of this. In plants, the one magical chemical that can take energy from the sun and convert it into usable energy is chlorophyll, chlorophyll A. This is the spectrum of chlorophyll A. So it obviously loves color in the red, it loves color in the purple and blue, but it doesn't deal so much with colors in the green. And that's why plants are green. They don't, they're reflecting that light. They don't make usable energy from it. But Plants also over time evolved a different type of chlorophyll called chlorophyll B. Chlorophyll B is able to pass off some of that information or that energy to chlorophyll A during photosynthesis, but what it allows them to do is it allows them to absorb more of the spectrum of light. So it allows them to use more of the energy of the sun. So just by getting a little variability in the chemical structure of chlorophyll, they're able to do better as an organism. Variety, again, is the spice of life. And so basically, I'm going to talk about how variation in the molecules of cells can increase their success. Example I'll talk about is phospholipids, and a great example of that is winter wheat, how they can vary the amount of phospholipids. And then I'll talk about genes, and so how variation in the actual genes can give them heterozygote advantage. Example we've talked about before is sickle cell disease. And then finally, I'm gonna talk about something that's relatively new and that's gene duplication and the importance of that in organisms. Example I'll talk about is the antifreeze gene that's found in a number of different uh, organisms that live in really cold environments. And so let's start with molecular variation. So this is gonna be variation within the molecules of a cell. So um, since you've made it all the way to podcast 52, you've seen the, the podcast on phospholipids. Phospholipids essentially have two parts. They have a hydrophilic head and then they're going to have a hydrophobic tail. And so these make up all the membranes in all of the uh, all cells essentially. And so basically this would be the phospholipids and again they float horizontally back and forth. They're flexible and so they allow material to move back and forth. But the depending on how those um, fatty acid tails are, they have a different behavior. And so basically, if you get a double bond here because you lack oxygen, there will be a kink on this tail. And those kinky tails will cause the phospholipids to move farther apart. So they can't get quite as close together. And so as the temperature gets colder and colder and colder, these phospholipids are going to get closer and closer together. And so a way to deal with changes in temperature is to have more of these unsaturated fatty acids in the tails. And so they can't pack as closely together. And so winter wheat is a type of wheat that we grow here in Montana. I think it came from Russia originally, but basically what happens is you plant it in the fall. It'll start to grow and then all of a sudden the snow will come. The snow will come and so now when spring comes, it can start growing again. It kind of has a head start on spring wheat, which you're going to plant in the spring. And so what scientists have found is that there's an increase in the amount of unsaturated fats and they can vary the amount of unsaturated fats in the wheat. In other words, you could grow wheat in a, uh, a warm temperature and in a cold temperature and you're going to find that they're able to produce more of the unsaturated fats during a period of time when it's cold. And so what that means is cells are able to create more molecules or a variety of molecules depending on their local environment. And I think there are something like 18 different types of phospholipids that are created in cells. And so uh, I, I had this idea at one time when I was learning biology that phospholipids were boring and it's the proteins that are important, but we're finding that the phospholipids are just as important as, as the proteins as well. Okay, next we're looking at the genes. And so heterozygote advantage, heterozygote advantage is when you have two copies of a gene and that gives you uh, some kind of an advantage. And so this is the most deadly animal we have on our planet. It's the Anopheles mosquito. It passes an organism called the plasmodium basically what it does is causes a malaria. Malaria is killing more people every year than any other disease on our planet. And so basically it's a, there's a huge amount of selective pressure, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. And so the, the story of heterozygote advantage is that if you have a sickle cell disease or you have a sickle cell gene, you produce red blood cells that have the sickled appearance. 
Basically, it's a mutation or a change in a single letter in the uh, gene that makes the protein hemoglobin in our blood. And so if you have two copies of that, you make sickle cell blood. And so if we look at this study here, this is a study that was done in Kenya on children that were born. So this is 100% of the children that were born here. And then they looked at how many of them survived days after they were born. And so to kind of get this set, this would be 77% of them living, you know, something like four, five years later in this, in this study. And so basically what they found is that if you have sickle cell disease, a number of those children are going to die off. And that's just due to complications in the sickle cell disease. But if you have perfectly good blood, then this is going to be the survivorship curve. But if you're a heterozygote, in other words, you have one copy of the sickle cell um, gene, but you have one good copy, we see a survivorship curve that's actually greater than that with no problem. In other words, the heterozygotes are doing better. And the reason why is that by having that one gene, you make your red blood cells a little different, and so this, the, it can't be infected by this plasmodium. So it can't be affected by the malarial disease. So you're given protection against that disease. And so again, in this case, why do we have sickle cell disease? show up in a much higher percentage in those whose ancestors come from Africa, it's because it gave them protection against malaria. In other words, genes and having a variety of genes can actually help. The last one I want to talk about is gene duplication. And I want to start with an analogy. Uh, most of you have never seen of this, this um, movie, but it's called Multiplicity. Hopefully I'm spelling that right. And it was a Michael Keaton movie. It's a comedy. Basically, he discovers how he can make a clone of himself. And so he clones himself. And so essentially, if I were to do this, I would make a clone of myself who could go to school and teach. I make a clone of myself who could make podcasts. I make a clone of myself who can clean my house. So his idea is that he can now do the things that he wants to do in life, and he doesn't have to do all these other tasks. Now, of course, every it's a, it's a comedy, so the clones get dumber and dumber over time, and they make clones of themselves, and so it kind of spirals out of control. What's this analogy even telling us? Well, genes do the same thing. They have the same idea that Michael Keaton does. And so basically what they do, scientists had thought about this for a long period of time, is if a gene duplicates itself, so it makes a copy of itself, then this gene right here can continue doing its job that it always does, but the clone of that gene, since it doesn't have to do this job of the original gene, can do something else. So it can take on another task. In other words, once it's duplicated itself, and this is a little deep, now it doesn't have to adhere to natural selection. It's outside of that selective process, and so it can become anything it wants to. And so uh, scientists had, had theorized for a long period of time that this is a way that we can actually get evolution or evolutionary novelty. And so we're starting to see how this actually works. This is a fish right here uh, called the eel pout. This is a picture taken from a submersible. And you can see an eel pout right here. And so basically they're able to live in temperature that is near or below freezing. And that's due to pressure. You could actually go below deg zero degrees Celsius. And so they wondered how this could be. And they discovered that there's an anti antifreeze protein. This is a subclass 3 antifreeze protein that's found in these eel pouts. Basically, ice crystals aren't going to start to form in their cells because of this protein that they have. And so how could this evolve? Well, what they what they theorized for a long period of time is that it may be through gene duplication. Maybe we had a gene that did something before, but once it had been duplicated or once it had been cloned, it could become something else. And so if they, when they looked at it, they found that it looked a lot like this enzyme that's used in digestion. Uh, sialic acid synthase. It's actually found in humans. And so this scientist right here, her name is Christina Chang, uh, just within the last few years has identified both of these genes and she's able to show just by sequencing of the genes that this is how it formed. It, it formed through this gene duplication or this cloning of the gene. And that's how almost all of these antifreeze proteins came to be. In other words, they were enzymes that did one thing. Once they were freed from doing that job, they were able to evolve into another process. In this case, becoming an antifreeze protein. And so again, that's how we can get variation within cells. And again, variation leads to variety, which leads to the spice of life. And I hope that's helpful.